Chapter 6 of The Circular Staircase. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Oakley. The Circular Staircase by Mary Roberts Reinhardt. Chapter 6 In the East Corridor. When the detective left, he enjoined absolute secrecy on everybody in the household. The Greenwood Club promised the same thing and as there are no Sunday afternoon papers, the murder was not publicly known until Monday. The coroner himself notified the Armstrong family lawyer, and early in the morning he came out. I had not seen Mr. Jameson since morning, but I knew he had been interrogating the servants. Gertrude was locked in her room with a headache, and I had luncheon alone. Mr. Harton, the lawyer, was a little thin man, and he looked as if he did not relish his business that day. This is very unfortunate, Miss Innes, he said, after we had shaken hands. Most unfortunate, and mysterious. With the father and mother in the West, I find everything devolves on me, and, as you can understand, it is an unpleasant duty. No doubt, I said absently. Mr. Harton, I am going to ask you some questions, and I hope you will answer them. I feel that I am entitled to some knowledge, because I and my family are just now in a most ambiguous position. I don't know whether he understood me or not. He took off his glasses and wiped them. I shall be very happy, he said with an old-fashioned courtesy. Thank you, Mr. Harton. Did Mr. Arnold Armstrong know that Sunnyside had been rented? I think, yes, he did. In fact, I myself told him about it. And he knew who the tenants were? Yes. He had not been living with the family for some years, I believe. No. Unfortunately, there had been trouble between Arnold and his father. For two years he had lived in town. Then it would be unlikely that he came here last night to get possessions of anything belonging to him. I should think it's hardly possible, he admitted. To be perfectly frank, Miss Inns, I cannot think of any reason whatever for his coming here as he did. He had been staying at the clubhouse across the valley for the last week, Jarvis tells me, but that only explains how he came here, not why. It is a most unfortunate family. He shook his head despondently, and I felt that this dried-up little man was the repository of much that he had not told me. I gave up trying to elicit any information from him, and we went together to view the body before it was taken to the city. It had been lifted onto the billiard table and a sheet thrown over it, otherwise nothing had been touched. A soft hat lay beside it, and the collar of the dinner coat was still turned up. The handsome, dissipated face of Arnold Armstrong, purged of its ugly lines, was now only pathetic. As we went in, Mrs. Watson appeared at the card-room door. "'Come in, Mrs. Watson,' the lawyer said, but she shook her head and withdrew. She was the only one in the house who seemed to regret the dead man, and even seemed rather shocked than sorry. I went to the foot of the circular staircase and opened it. If I could only have seen Halsey coming at his usual hair-brained clip up the drive, if I could have heard the throb of the motor, I would have felt that my troubles were over. But there was nothing to be seen. The countryside lay sunny and quiet in its peaceful Sunday afternoon calm, and far down the drive Mr. Jameson was walking slowly, stooping now and then as if to examine the road. When I went back Mr. Harton was furtively wiping his eyes. The prodigal has come home, Miss Innes, he said. How often the sins of the fathers have visited on the children, which left me pondering. Before Mr. Harden left, he had told me something of the Armstrong family. Paul Armstrong, the father, had been married twice. Arnold was a son by the first marriage. The second Mrs. Armstrong had been a widow, with a child and a little girl. This child, now perhaps twenty, was Louise Armstrong, having taken her stepfather's name and was at present in California with the family. They will probably return at once, he concluded. Sad part of my errand here today is to see if you will relinquish your lease here in their favour. We would better wait and see if they wish to come, I said. It seems unlikely, and my townhouse is being remodelled. At that he let the matter drop, but it came up unpleasantly enough later. At six o'clock the body was taken away and at seven-thirty, after an early dinner, Mr. Harton went. Gertrude had not come down, and there was no news of Halsey. Mr. Jameson had taken a lodging in the village, and I had not seen him since mid-afternoon. 
It was about nine o'clock, I think, when the bell rang and he was ushered into the living room. Sit down, I said grimly. Have you found a clue that will incriminate me, Mr. Jameson? He had the grace to look uncomfortable. No, he said. If you had killed Mr. Armstrong, you would have left no clues. You would have had too much intelligence. After that we got along better. He was fishing in his pocket, and after a minute he brought out two scraps of paper. I have been to the clubhouse, he said, and among Mr. Armstrong's effects I found these. One is curious, the other is puzzling. The first was a sheet of club note paper, on which was written over and over the name Halsey B. Innes. It was Halsey's flowing signature to a dot, but it lacked Halsey's ease. The ones towards the bottom of the sheet were much better than the top ones. Mr. Jameson smiled at my face. His old tricks, he said. That one is merely curious. This one, as I said before, is puzzling. The second scrap folded and refolded into a compass so tiny that the writing had been partly obliterated was part of a letter, the lower half of a sheet, not typed but written in a cramped hand. By altering the plans for rooms may be possible. The best way, in my opinion, would be to the plan for in one of the room's chimney. That was all. Well, I said, looking up, there is nothing in that, is there? A man ought to be able to change the plan of his house without becoming an object of suspicion. There is little in the paper itself, he admitted, but why should Arnold Armstrong carry that around unless it meant something? He would never built a house, you may be sure of that. If it is this house, it may mean anything, from a secret room to an extra bathroom, I said scornfully. Haven't you a thumbprint too? I have, he said with a smile, and the print of a foot in a tulip bed, and a number of other things. The oddest part is, Miss Innes, that the thumb mark is probably yours, and the footprint, certainly. His audacity was the only thing that saved me. His amused smile put me on my mettle, and I ripped out a perfectly good scallop before I answered. Why did I step into the tulip bed? I asked with interest. You picked up something, he said good-humouredly, which you are going to tell me about later. Am I indeed? I was politely curious. With this remarkable insight of yours, I wish you would tell me where I should find my $4,000 motor car. I was just coming to that, he said. You'll find it about 30 miles away, at Andrew Station, in a blacksmith shop, where it is being repaired. I laid down my knitting, then, and looked at him. And Halsey, I managed to say. We are going to exchange information, he said. I am going to tell you that when you tell me what you picked up in the tulip bed. We looked steadily at each other. It was not an unfriendly stare. We were only measuring weapons. Then he smiled a little and got up. With your permission, he said, I am going to examine the card room and the staircase again. You might think over my offer in the meantime. He went on through the drawing room, and I listened to his footsteps growing gradually fainter. I dropped my pretense at knitting, and, leaning back, I thought over the last forty-eight hours. Here was I, Rachel Innes, spinster, a granddaughter of old John Innes of revolutionary days, a D.A.R., a colonial dame, mixed up with a vulgar and revolting crime, and even attempting to hoodwink the law. Certainly I had left the straight and narrow way. I was roused by hearing Mr. Jameson coming rapidly back through the drawing-room. He stopped at the door. "'Miss Innes,' he said quickly, "'will you come with me and light the east corridor? I fastened somebody in the small room at the head of the card-room stairs.' I jumped up at once. "'You mean the murderer?' I gasped. "'Possibly,' he said quietly, as we hurried together upstairs. Someone was lurking on the staircase when I went back. I spoke. Instead of an answer, whoever it was turned and ran up. I followed. It was dark. But as I turned the corner at the top, a figure darted through this door and closed it. The bolt was on my side, and I pushed it forward. It is a closet, I think. We are up in the upper hall now. If you will show me the electric switch, Miss Innes, you would better wait in your own room. Trembling as I was, I was determined to see the door opened. I hardly knew what I feared, but so many terrible and inexplicable things had happened that suspense was worse than certainty. I am perfectly cool, I said, and I am going to remain here. The lights flashed up along the, at that end of the corridor, throwing the doors into relief. 
At the intersection of a small hallway, with the larger, the circular staircase wound its way up, as if it had been an afterthought of the architect. And just around the corner, in the small corridor, was the door Mr. Jameson had indicated. I was still unfamiliar with the house, and I did not remember the door. My heart was thumping wildly in my ears, but I nodded to him to go ahead. I was perhaps eight or ten feet away, and then he threw the bolt back. "'Come out,' he said quietly. There was no response. "'Come out,' he repeated. Then, I think he had a revolver, but I'm not sure, he stepped inside and threw the door open. From where I stood I could not see beyond the door, but I saw Mr. Jameson's face change and heard him mutter something. Then he bolted down the stairs, three at a time. When my knees had stopped shaking, I moved forward, slowly, nervously, until I had a partial view of what was beyond the door. It seemed at first to be a closet, empty. Then I went close and examined it, to stop with a shudder. Where the floor should have been was black void and darkness, from which came the indescribable damp smell of the cellars. Mr. Jameson had locked somebody in the closed chute. As I leaned over, I fancied I heard a groan. Or was it the wind? End of chapter 6 Recording by Jason Oakley Brisbane, Australia www.bangrocks.com